Uh, welcome to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and allied fields related to the built environment, providing an opportunity for the audience to engage in real time. And today we have parking reform trends with uh, Katie Gould, Patrick Sigmund, and Tony Jordan. And uh, I'll be the interviewer and moderator. My name is Rob Studeville, the CNU. So register for coming webinars uh, April 4th. Uh, what's new at CNU 31? CNU leaders will discuss ex extensive program changes at the upcoming Congress in Charlotte. And um, um, as well as, as some exciting things that are happening uh, in Charlotte uh, at CNU 31. And April 11th, uh, join us for in a conversation with urban designers and architects involved with car-free urbanism. Cul-de-sac Tempe and Cul-de-sac Atlanta are highly watched developments that are eliminating cars in residential areas, which allows for innovative urban design solutions. Go to cnu.org slash resources slash on the park bench. And uh, don't forget about CNU 31 in Charlotte, taking place May 31st through June 3rd in one of the most diverse, vibrant cities in the American Southeast with deep roots in new urbanism, the Queen City of Charlotte, North Carolina. Go to cnu.org slash cnu31 for more information. And um, first you might wanna join or renew your membership because becoming a member a uh, current member, uh, you can save $250 off of your CNU 31 registration. Check your membership status today. Um, it'll pay for your membership, members.cnu.org slash memberships. And we have a great program today. Uh, Katie Gould is a researcher with the Sightline Institute writing about climate and transportation policy. She recently wrote a paper for the Lincoln Institute of Land Planning called Shifting Gears, Why Communities Are Eliminating Off-Street Parking Requirements and What Comes Next, which was republished on Public Square um, in a popular series of articles. And Patrick Sigmund is a transportation planner and economist and founder of Sigmund and Associates. He has the transportation, um, he has led the transportation component of more than 70 citywide neighborhood district and campus plans. His career has had a particular focus on parking and he was one of the earliest proponents of parking policy reform at CNU. Tony Jordan is president and co-founder of the Parking Reform Network, a worldwide membership organization that includes elected officials, researchers, planners, and activists. I'm Rob Studeville, editor of CNU's Public Square. Today's discussion is all about parking reform and why it is gaining momentum nationwide at various levels of government. Uh, first, there's going to be presentations, followed by a discussion among the panelists, and then Q&A from the audience, and we expect a lively discussion. So please use the Q&A function of Zoom uh, to ask your questions as they occur to you. And now I'm going to pass this along to Katie. All right, let's get going here. All right, uh, my name is Katie Gould. I'm a senior transportation researcher with Sightline, and uh, we're talking about the end of parking mandates. Very exciting topic today. Um, first, in case you got uh, into this room by accident, what's a parking mandate, otherwise known as a minimum parking requirement? Um, pretty much since the 1950s, nearly every building in North America, whether it's new or remodeled, has been required by local governments to have a certain number of off-street parking spaces. And the idea initially was, right, that if there's enough, if there's parking for every car, there's going to be no parking problems. And these rules have been really successful in one way. Uh, we've built a lot of parking spots. Uh, researchers estimate that in the United States, there's somewhere between three and seven parking spots for every vehicle. Uh, but these regulations have not been effective at managing on-street parking, and they make a, a whole host of worse problems, including suburban sprawl, urban heat islands, um, tons of impervious surface. Um, it makes new homes and businesses more costly to build, and it really makes it hard to give old buildings new life.
And because of all those impacts, cities are repealing parking mandates in increasing numbers. Uh, this map is from the Parking Reform Network. Tony Jordan's going to talk in a few minutes. Um, and this map is referenced by cities all the time when they're making the case to get rid of parking minimums because every year it's getting a lot easier for cities to see their peers on this map, whether they're big or small, hot climate, cold climate. Um, there's a, a huge number of cities that are implementing these reform these days. Um, a lot of these dots are orange. You can see um, which is for the city center or downtown areas. That's kind of where this type of parking reform has started. Um, in those areas is more historic and there's a lot of buildings that already don't conform with current zoning codes. Um, but that's not where we're headed. Uh, we know this chart is a bit of an undercount, um, but we're seeing rapid growth in the number of cities that are eliminating all parking mandates, citywide, all uses, uh, which is really exciting to be moving on from this downtown area. Um, some notable ones that you might have seen in the news recently, Anchorage, Alaska, which covers an area larger than the state of Rhode Island, also San Jose, California, which is home to almost a million people. Um, there's another really big uh, recent change. This year, there's really significant statewide reforms coming out of the West Coast. So last July in Oregon, the Land Conservation and Development Commission adopted a broad rulemaking package called the Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities um, that applies to the state metro areas. So there's a lot of different rules that are included that reform, but eliminating parking mandates in many instances um, was a, a major part of it. Um, those categories include all properties that are within a half a mile of frequent transit corridors, um, but also a lot of other categories like uh, small homes, affordable housing, uh, child care facilities, housing for people with disabilities, and more. And then in September, California adopted AB 2097, which prohibits cities from requiring a minimum number of off-street parking spaces uh, within a half mile of frequent transit stations statewide. So that was the third attempt to pass a bill like this in a decade. So this is a, it's a really big victory. Both of these states, the new rules went into effect on January 1st. So we're still in like the first few months of these rules going into effect um, and people being able to build things for the first time, um, maybe in decades. And we know an, a handful of other states have introduced or are considering introducing similar legislation. Um, anyways, I wanted to put this uh, picture up here. This is actually the apartment building I live in. Um, it was built in the early 1900s and is now re-legalized in a lot of places. It has no parking. <laughs> um, okay, so now what, right? When your city gets rid of off-street parking requirements, what happens? Um, this is a, a pretty new reform, um, but there are a couple kind of leader cities that we're being able to learn from. So first off, um, this is from Fayetteville, Arkansas. Planners here eliminated commercial parking requirements back in 2015, um, primarily for the reason that they kept getting the same phone calls about like vacant properties. Um, and year over year, potential developers were interested in a property um, and they call, but you know the buildings were still left vacant and then never redeveloped. Um, so getting rid of minimum parking requirements was one step that the city knew they could do um, to reduce the barrier to redevelopment. So this building um, right here, this is on the edge of downtown. It had been vacant for 40 years. Um, and just four years after the zoning reform, it finally reopened its doors as a restaurant. And this building only has five parking spaces, uh, which is primarily used for employees. And parking here sometimes is a headache, um, the, the owners will tell you. Um, since they opened, there's two parking lots in the area that have redeveloped into housing. Fayetteville in Northwest Arkansas is um, seeing quite a bit of population growth. Um, but the view was the main draw here that the owners really fell in love with this location for, and it's great that they were able to make that, that choice. Um, other building conversions that have no existing parking of their own work out deals with nearby parking garages to kind of share resources. Um, so I was told that this building here was once referred to as the largest pigeon coop in Connecticut. <laughs> Um, this building and the one um, next door here, they were both former office buildings in downtown Hartford um, that had been vacant for a long time, and now they're home to um, 250, more than 250 new residences. Um, and there's no off-street parking here, um, and it would be prohibitively expensive to remodel the buildings to add some. 
Um, so tenants that do have cars can use this parking garage on the same block, right, and pay an extra fee. And this is a really great win-win situation. Um, down, downtown, <laughs> downtown everywhere, right, has less office workers than there used to be. So this is a good deal for the parking garage too to get um, some more tenants. Some of the best information we have um, comes out of a study out of Buffalo, New York, which was one of the first cities to eliminate all parking mandates citywide. Uh, last year, there was a study published um, that looked at 36 new major developments that were permitted in the first two years after the reform. And here's some of the findings. So left up to the market, 83% of all new building projects still provided off-street parking voluntarily. And over half of the projects provided the same or more parking than that would have met the old codes. So um, it's a fraction of new buildings that are using the new flexibility, but it does make a big impact. Overall, the market built 20% fewer parking spaces that would have been re required under the old codes. Um, and there's no doubt that mixed use buildings saw the, the most benefits of this new flexibility. And typically when projects have housing and businesses together, parking requirements are additive. So you have to meet the requirement for every use that you have in the building, um, even though in reality, the parking gets very busy at different times of day. Um, and the parking requirements in total can be quite high um, when you add them all together. Uh, and projects that did use the new flexibility ended up building twice as many new homes and over twice as much new commercial space as um, building projects that would have met the old code. So being able to build a few less parking spaces really opens up a lot of opportunities for new homes and new businesses. Seattle saw really similar results when they reduced parking requirements near transit back in 2012. Um, there was a really big study that um, covered five years after the reform. Researchers tracked over 800 new multifamily buildings and they found that 59% of all the new homes would have been illegal under the old code. So that flexibility allowed 35,000 new homes, which is 10% of Seattle's, Seattle's entire housing stock to build the amount of parking they thought they needed um, without the extra cost or delay of asking for a variance. And overall, the new buildings um, constructed 40% fewer parking spaces than they would have been required to before. And instead of creating like a parking shortage, it's much more appropriate to think of this as like a market correction. Around the same time, King County, uh, where Seattle's located in, was conduct conducting a study on actual parking use at multifamily buildings. And they found on average parking was oversupplied by 40%. <laughs> um, so we see this correction that's happening naturally um, when developers can build the amount of parking that they think they need. Um, and because of this code change, right, this is a time when Seattle is really growing a lot. Um, the city was saved from 18,000 unneeded parking spots, which would cover over 100 football fields. So um, really big impact for the city. Um, this is my contact information, but I'm going to hand it off to Patrick, and then we'll get to questions at the end. Thank you. All right. Well, hi, all. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm really looking forward to your questions today. So I will try to be brief. But to begin, let me mention a couple of things. First of all, if you're a parking consultant like me, um, or a transportation planner like me, you may be worried, what are you going to do in life for money? when you are no longer hired by developers who need relief from excessive minimum parking requirements. Well, there's good news. And that is there's a lifetime's work of work to be done managing curb parking, which is an underdeveloped skill that will be needed more and more because that's what everybody's afraid of. I'm gonna share my screen and show you just a couple examples of recently implemented um, reforms. And so to begin here, um, this picture is of my hometown in Palo Alto, California. Um, my mom and dad bought their first house in Palo Alto in, um, uh, well, before I was born. Um, my dad remembers they paid about $16,000 for it. Um, and at the time it was 10 cents an hour to park on University Avenue in downtown Palo Alto. Well, today, if I could afford that house, it would cost me $3 million and it's free to park downtown. 
So in the space of a generation, we've completely solved our affordable housing problem for our cars. Now, I think that's backwards. But what happens if you say, let's make it legal again to build something like this beautiful building by Pedro de Lemos. Um, and people say, oh my God, the parking will become overcrowded on the street. People will double park, they'll drive in circles. It'll be a disaster. Well, fortunately, UCLA professor Donald Shoup has proposed three reforms and cities all over the country and all around the world are beginning to adopt them. Um, and they are, first, charge the right prices for curb parking, by which he means charge the lowest price that will get you one or two available spaces on every block most of the time. Oh, and charge the lowest price that will achieve that goal. Second, return the parking revenue generated to the blocks where it's created to pay for public services. And that helps make this politically popular. And then third, you can remove minimum parking regulations. Well, this is certainly one way. I wanna point out though that um, there's another way that actually is also very effective. Um, the Code of Hammurabi, the ancient um, first law code that we found, uh, it prohibits stationing chariots in the street um, and the penalty was death. So this completely eliminates repeat offenders. It's very good. Um, but I know some of you are softies, so this is a little less of a law and order approach. In Berkeley, the liberals there are, are charging the right prices for curb parking. Berkeley charges the lowest rate needed to achieve their mandated occupancy goal, which is 65 to 80% occupancy on each block. Um, rates are now 50 cents to four bucks an hour. I checked yesterday. Um, here's the map. You can see that in the heart of downtown, the prices are highest in front of the busiest restaurants and blocks and on the streets where demand is much lower and things are less popular. It's only 50 cents an hour and it varies in between. Um, I helped create this program uh, with a study that back in 2011, 2013, it went into effect. There isn't a formal policy re returning the revenue, um, but the meters uh, do in fact help fund public services for the downtown blocks. And uh, it includes security in the form of downtown ambassadors um, who walk the street, keep an eye on things, help out visitors. It includes cleaning, street sweeping, sidewalk steam cleaning, help for the homeless, helps fund parking. Um, and this was actually an informal deal in that the city said, look, merchants, if you agree to let us increase meter uh, rates, we will agree to join the downtown uh, new property-based business improvement district um, and our, we'll be paying our uh, a fee for every downtown building the city owns, which is a lot of property. Um, the um, enforcement in Berkeley has been eased by modern technologies and many cities are adopting these. So for example, Every parking enforcement vehicle is equipped with license plate readers. You can see the uh, cameras there, license plate recognition system cameras. Um, so now in the residential parking permit areas in the city, your license plate serves as your virtual parking permit and you don't need to you know, go down to city hall and get a plastic bumper sticker and stick it on your car every year. Um, similarly, they are able to use these cameras to enforce time limits, to check permits, um, to, to check um, actually meter compliance. The um, other thing that the city is intending to do, and I'm not sure if they've got it up and running yet, is since the uh, vehicles are counting license plates on each block, it's not hard for them to measure occupancy and they wanna start generating automatic maps of occupancy. Now, the other way that cities are doing this is using their wirelessly network parking meters they're measuring occupancy um, or estimating occupancy based on revenue data, right? If people are paying a lot, you know that occupancy is pretty high. Um, the results, well, one year after the program went into effect, uh, scholars at UC Berkeley and elsewhere studied the program carefully using um, federal funding. They found that finding parking had gotten much easier according to most drivers surveyed. 
Um, fewer people are parking on the street, more are parking in the formerly underused city garages and lots. And there's so much less circling for underpriced curb parking that there's 693,000 fewer vehicle miles of travel per year just because people are no longer driving in circles searching for free curb parking. A surprising amount of traffic in our downtowns consists of people who, um, you know, frankly, they're not going anywhere. They've already arrived. They're just looking for a bargain. San Francisco, I will skip over, but they have a similar program that has delivered great results. And the one thing I will say is San Francisco's demand-based pricing has resulted in a 35% increase in sales tax revenue in the seven pilot program areas compared to less than a 20% increase in the areas where the old fixed price meters were left in place. So if um, businesses are afraid they'll make too much money and you know are really afraid of that, don't do demand-based pricing. Managing curb parking in residential areas. You know, a lot of us would like to make it legal once again to build the kind of beautiful historic California architecture like this lovely fourplex in Pasadena, which is beautiful in part because it's not marred by minimum parking requirements converting all that green into asphalt. Well, it's got no off-street parking. If you propose this today, people would worry about overcrowded curbs. So if you wanna restore the practice of building missing middle housing, as Dan Perola calls it, and, and allow once again, duplexes and courtyard apartments and bungalow courts and a small apartment buildings in single family neighborhoods, you need to learn how to manage curb parking well. So first, don't do what Boston did. Boston, like a lot of cities, set up their policy, said, we're just gonna give everybody free residential permits up to X permits per household. They gave out 3,933 residential permits for the Beacon Hill neighborhood. Years later, somebody counted and discovered the neighborhood only has 983 curb parking spaces. So of course it didn't work to prevent overcrowding. Well, by contrast, you can adopt a policy that says, we're gonna issue no more than one curb permit per parking, curb parking space that actually legally exists. And if you're above that target now, well, you could create a waiting list for new permits until the number in circulation dwindles. But what Tucson does is they have a policy that says you can have no more than one permit for a property for every legal curb parking space that's available on the frontage of your property. So suppose you tear down a single family house and you put up a 12 unit apartment building. The city comes and says, well, you've got three legal curb parking spaces in front of your property. So you, the developer building owner can have three on-street parking permits that are good to park in the neighborhood. What if your tenants have more cars? Well, you better either voluntarily build some off-street parking if you have no you know, minimum parking regulations demanding you build more. Um, or your future tenants are gonna rent some of that excess parking that's all over American cities because we've imposed minimum regulations for so long. Well, with that, um, we could talk residential parking benefit districts later, which is another great technique, but uh, in some charge the right prices for curb parking return the revenue to the neighborhood to pay for public services, and then you can remove all your minimum parking regulations. And this works anywhere. You don't need transit. You don't need anything else. All you need to do to remove minimum parking requirements is learn how to manage curb parking. Um, and luckily it's pretty fun and uh, I've enjoyed doing it for many years. So with that, let me turn things over to Tony. Thank you, Patrick. I guess I gotta, you have to stop sharing for me. Oh. It's really nice to be able to follow up on such great informative presentations that cover the basics of parking policy reform. And then I can talk about uh, what I'm 
best at here is uh, how to organize. Um, so um, we have, let me just arrange some stuff here so I know what I'm doing. All right, um, so we've heard what's happening around the country and we heard about the important policies that we have to implement in order to uh, to deal with the impacts of eliminating minimums and, and what we need to do to move forward and keep these things politically durable. I'm gonna share some theories about why these reforms are happening uh, more frequently and how we can accelerate the incineration of costly parking mandates and adoption of complementary policies. And I know uh, Professor Shoup is in the audience, so apologies for this uh, great laser eye um, slide I made, but I think, I think we're, really, we're really moving forward on this and it's unstoppable. So first, these reforms just make sense. They're logical, they're revenue neutral, if not positive, and they regularly result in win-wins for cities and communities that implement them. And the status quo is ridiculous. It's a house of cards. It's an emperor with no clothes. It's just waiting to be called out. And that's the genius of uh, the high cost of free parking. Of course, being right doesn't mean you're gonna win and get what you want. But in my experience, when you point out the hidden costs of parking and the space that it takes up, and then you top it off with examples of how arbitrary the ratios are, like these ones in Dallas for similar land uses, dry cleaner versus laundry service, appliance repair versus electronics repair. Um, people get it. And while only a select few may become shoopistas, at the very least, people are find, find it hard to, they're less likely to oppose reforms. They'll think twice before they propose reforms when you're, when you're, when you're proposing them. Another reason these reforms are happening is that we've got evidence from places with no mandates that the sky doesn't fall. Uh, for decades, hundreds of cities and towns have had no parking mandates in their city centers. And the results from Vanguard cities with more expansive reforms, uh, which Katie pointed out several, is actually kind of a mixed bag. On the one hand, we have examples it takes a long time for significant development without parking to happen. And when it does happen, some on-street permits and meters are the proper medicine. But on the other hand, we're facing multiple threats like climate change and, and housing crisis, and we need to get busy building housing and retrofitting our cities. And of course, the herd is on the move. Cities are seeing their peers make big changes, and they seem a lot more reasonable now than they did even just a few years ago. And places that were in the middle of long-term incremental plans are looking around and realizing that they're behind the curve now and are just going for full repeal. And those are the reasons we regularly see covered, but it's my opinion we're seeing a lot of this fantastic progress because of the addition of a powerful catalyst, which is organizing. So what is organizing? Uh, you'll find a lot of definitions, but at the core, it's the hard and gratifying work of moving people to take action for a common goal that's usually part of a longer term mission and vision. Organizing goes beyond just raising awareness or proposing solutions to things. It involves finding leaders, sharing skills on public comment, persuasion, effective activism, and I believe the most important organizing for parking reform happens at the local level, it's grassroots. So I'm gonna quickly share with you a case study of organizing for parking reforms. It happens to be the story of how I ended up doing this and, and founding the Parking Reform Network. Um, okay, so these are pictures from Southeast Division Street in Portland, uh, just a few years apart. In the 1970s, there was supposed to be a freeway built along this road, and a lot of buildings were torn down, leaving light industrial, low-density housing, and parking lots. Today, this is a destination restaurant row full of shops and apartments, and there's a high-capacity bus line that runs down the street. But controversy about these developments almost reversed decades of progress in Portland. So long story, pretty short. In 2002, the city, to very little fanfare, eliminated parking requirements along streets with high-frequency transit and nothing really happened. Then about 10 years later, as the story goes, some developers visited Portland at the peak of our bicycle and transit mode share and decided to take a chance building mid-size apartments with no off-street parking. And the buildings leased up, so other developers followed and we had a building boom on our hands. But then the nearby neighbors flipped out and Portland had never implemented a solid parking permit program, so the city was kind of stuck without a ready solution and they proposed a new set of mandates. I'd read, Donald Chup's book in 2010. So I showed up at the city council and planning commission to oppose these new mandates. And I met like-minded people and we built a mailing list and I helped turn people out to testify, but we lost. And in 2013, the city began requiring parking in buildings with more than 30 units again. But I didn't give up. Uh, I got appointed to some parking committees. I kept learning. And in 2015, I founded what would become Portlanders for Parking Reform, which was probably the first 
parking reform specific organization that exists. I got to work reaching out to likely allies on this topic, um, housing groups, bike groups, pedestrians. And one of the first groups I presented to was Bike Loud, which Katie was the co-chair of at the time. Um, these groups had reasons to support parking reforms, but largely they were unaware that there even was such a thing as parking reform, <laughs> let alone tracking opportunities for advocacy and how to push things along. So I started spreading the word farther than Portland too. Uh, I was, for example, the only scheduled parking reform presentation at the first Yimby Town conference in 2016. Mm -hmm. Locally in Portland, we spread awareness and we built a community around this topic uh, with education, outreach, and fun social events. Um, we made memes and infographics. We organized walking tours, happy hours, and bike rides. And of course, we turned people out to testify. Uh, that photo up top shows uh, a couple of my members of uh, Portlanders for Parking Reform, but also three of my coworkers who I convinced to have a lunchtime burrito to stand in line and sign up other people who had day jobs all day to, to testify later in the afternoon. Um, and similar tactics are deployed all over the country and locally here in Portland regularly to overcome the inherent inequity and difficulty in how our cities take comment on land use and transportation issues. Um, one more slide. And this worked. Um, a quick rundown, you know, we found, I founded Portlanders for Parking Reform uh, in 2015. In 2016, we averted an expansion of these of parking mandates into an area of town, Northwest Portland, that had never had them. Uh, in 2017, our comprehensive plan and in inclusionary housing made park, those existing parking reforms basically obsolete. Uh, we passed a performance-based parking, parking policy in 2018. In 2020, we passed our residential info project, which legalized four plexes with no parking citywide. In 2021, we passed a more advanced uh, policy around parking pricing. And in 2022, as Katie mentioned, we passed our statewide reforms, climate-friendly and equitable cities, which has eliminated parking mandates in most of our cities near transit. And um, by the summer, dozens of Portland, Oregon cities will have no parking mandates. So to summarize, parking reform is a growth industry. It's easier than most people think, but it still takes a lot of work. And we're here to help you at the Parking Reform Network. So thanks. Okay, we got a lot of great questions at Q and A um, that are being asked by the audience, but I'm going to ask a few questions uh, first. And uh, um, the first question maybe seemed like an obvious one, but Don Shoup's book, "The High Cost of Free Parking," came out almost 20 years ago. Why is the parking issue getting so much traction now? And any of you can pick up on that. I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, so first of all, um, the, the housing crisis for people in America has grown worse and worse and worse in the last few years to the point where it used to be mostly really hurting poor people who often don't have the money, time, skills, or influence to, to organize well. Um, a big factor is that not only have a lot of middle class people gotten hurt and started getting angry and and becoming politically active on housing for people but they've also been getting funding so for example the yimby town conference was funded by yimby groups many of those groups are well funded now like we're talking million dollar budgets um and they are noticing professor shoop's work and other scholars work and just the plain logic that if you're, um, you know, creating cities that have free parking for cars, you don't have room left for reasonably affordable housing for humans. Um, and then another thing is the turnover. You know, I, 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 in my college classes in '92, discovered Don Chup's writing, and have spent 20 years working in the trenches to reform. And a lot of a lot of the people who used to oppose me are have uh, enjoying they're enjoying a peaceful retirement bass fishing somewhere, and it's great. So it's a new generation of, of planners. Other thoughts? Uh... Yeah, I would agree. The housing crisis is in every state now, right? I think is is much more common knowledge that we've been underbuilding 
uh, new homes for decades now, and we're really seeing the cost impacts of that, and there's just not enough housing options. Um, and I hear from developers all the time, right, they say when they are trying to figure out what they can build on a property, they figure out what can the property park, and then they build the amount of units that they're allowed to build based on the parking spots, right? Like that's how we've been designing our communities for decades and it's just, it has like the wrong priorities. Um, so I think when, you know, government officials are looking like, how can we, what's what's a good solution for the housing crisis and to boost housing supply, um, getting rid of these regulations doesn't cost the city anything, right? This is something that um, has a big benefit where there's gonna be more homes added to your community and less red tape um, for government officials to go through in the permitting process. It's um, it's, a, it's a very low hanging fruit solution. Um, so but you, do, you do have to be confident that there's not gonna be a parking crisis in the next year. So until recently, this uh, parking seemed to be exclusively a local issue. And now we're seeing a bunch of states taking action. And so what has changed and why uh, politically, Tony? thoughts on this? I, I think that um, a big part of that, as I kind of alluded to, is, is just the, the awareness that it has, it doesn't, like that, it, that it's possible. Seeing some, some evidence from the cities that took the first steps on this, I think is big. I do think that, you know, the, 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 and, and to just add on the last question, it's, you know, we have housing crisis, but we also have, you know, an increasingly dire climate crisis and people are more aware of, of the impacts of just automobile centric development in general, which I think is, is providing, it's not the top line issue all the time, but it provides an, an energy. So I think when just the, the, these ideas are percolating up into the, into the, the statewide offices. And I think that also it's recognized that it's, it is, the cities that want to do these policies can definitely use the cover and the help from from having a statewide bill. So I think to some degree there's a bit of like request or or, or de demand from from municipalities to have some impetus to 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 eliminate or or reform their policies. Take a second look at. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to like sort so of. Uh, put yourself in the position of opponents, uh, you know, there are still opponents to this. Um, what are the most effective arguments um, you hear against parking reform? Um, and how can they be answered? Uh, Patrick? So opponents can take advantage of the fact that even most college graduates in America are not required to take an economics class. And the average person um, is motivated by the fact that they currently park free on 99% of all trips to want to believe that um, a zoning code is like a book of magic spells. And that if you write in it that parking must be free and abundant, that the magical developer genie will show up and provide the parking for free um, at no cost to anybody else. Well, in reality, um, the parking cost is initially paid for by the developer, but then passed along to the consumers. Since most people don't own, know that, it's real easy for opponents to claim that the developer just pays for the cost of all the parking requirements, and that if you remove the requirements, they're getting, you know, the developer is getting away with something. Well, that's been a pretty effective argument for supporters of removing minimum parking mandates like me. Um, the counter argument is that the evidence shows very clearly that, in fact, houses that, for example, don't come with on-site parking rent for a lot less and sell for a lot less. So actually, yes, while the cost to the developer goes down, the profit also goes down, you know, the sales price goes down. So it's really a give back to renters and home buyers to remove minimum parking requirements. But for opponents, they can often effectively claim the opposite is true. I, I would argue that also there's not as much, the most effective barriers here are not so much arguments as appeals, appeals to self-interest. Everyone's got cars, everyone wants to drive. The current situation doesn't work for me. 
or appeals to, um, you know, this is going to impact people who are low income. This is going to impact people who have disability. So, and and, and I and, and the, I I make, I make that distinction because usually they're not coming with evidence. They're not actually arguments. They're just pointing these things out as a way to slow down or, or put stumbling blocks. And and we can really look at the evidence of who owns the most cars, who drives the most, what access, equitable access really looks like in a community and those appeals fall apart, but you have to kind of be confident and, and, and have some, some, some ready-made, you know, evidence and, and believe in, in that this is, there are some trade-offs occasionally, but that this is generally a, a net positive overall to be able to, to push back on those, those opponents. So we got a bunch of Q and A, um, right now and so i might as well just dive right into that because i think that's most interesting but uh uh the first one that was asked uh, uh what do you guys think about uh getting rid of off-street parking requirements for only affordable housing developments or housing for folks with disabilities does keeping them in place only for market rate housing create some strange equity dynamics and um, i think that's an interesting question um who wants to take a stab at that? I'd love to. There are, I would say, um, in my experience of like, what are the buildings that, or the developments that that come forth in the years right after a parking form that are like really raring to go, that parking really made a huge difference for that building. We do see um, a few categories of redevelopment that seem to happen over and over again in different cities. And that is affordable housing, housing for people with disabilities, um, reuse of historic buildings and or also like buildings that are near transit right those are kind of categories where people have a slightly lower rate of car ownership than average um, because of lower incomes or people are unable to drive um, but this is really a also a political question parking mandates don't make sense anywhere um, holding every apartment building in your city to build the exactly the same minimum number of parking spots um, doesn't make sense no matter where you are. You're going to be hurting someone and you're gonna be reducing the number of apartments being built in your city. Absolutely. So this is really about the politics, right? If if the, the politics aren't there to get rid of all parking mandates citywide, this is kind of an intermediate step that people will take that um, people who are concerned about a lack of parking maybe can get behind, right? For certain categories, but it is kind of a partial step. Um, but those are the categories that um, definitely will will utilize the flexibility and the rules for sure. So we have a question about the economic um, advantages of um, uh, uh, reduction in uh, off street parking, um, both for uh, I think in the macro sense for the city as a whole. Um, in terms of greater value of, of uh, buildings versus parking lots, but also uh, what is the uh, uh, what is the personal income, uh, pot the potential advantages of getting rid of mi minimum parking requirements? Um, Patrick, as the economist. Sure, sir. Uh, so it, it varies a great deal from place to place. Um, basically, minimum parking regulations do the most damage in the places where land values are the highest. So they... Um, because that's where people are really motivated to reduce um, the the amount of parking they build by the fact that it's very expensive to buy a lot of surface land and also very expensive to go above ground with structures or below ground with with um, uh, spaces. The um, so the the answer varies a great deal from place to place. For evidence on this topic, I really recommend many of the studies that are summarized in books like, oh, for example, Parking in the City, which Donald Shoup edited. I wrote a chapter for um, also the high cost of free parking. So for example, on the topic of housing, um, one recent study found that requiring a single enclosed parking space adds about 17% to the average apartments or the average homes rent in the United States. That's nationwide, a single space. So if you can save if that by renting a space without, um, I mean, renting a, an apartment without a 
parking space bundled with it, you can save 17% on rent on average across the United States. That's amazing. Um, here is an interesting qu question. Uh, given that streets are public space, which also have a high opportunity cost for other uses, such as cycling uh, infrastructure, bike, uh, bus lanes, loading zones, et cetera, et cetera, is it really wise to favor on-street parking over off-street parking options? Um, Katie, Tony? I, I would say that, no, I mean, no, <laughs> you know, obviously we should use part of, part of the, the one of the, I think the better things about when you start to work on parking reform is you do start to see what the other uses you, once you start looking at the curb as a valuable space and not just a, a storage space for vehicles. Um, and you think about that it, and you, you recognize its value in places where it is in high demand, you can start to actually more effectively figure out what the best use is for that space. COVID, of course, opened up a lot of people's eyes to the fact that the curb could be more than just a place to park a car. Um, but I, th I think that that part of part of the nice thing when you're doing, for example, these performance-based parking or demand-based parking uh, per management that Patrick described, it makes it more possible to remove, for example, a, a, a section of street for a bike lane or a bus lane, remove parking from an area because then the the demand that overflows to the adjacent spaces increases the value of those spaces. So the city doesn't necessarily lose the revenue it might be using for for um, from that from that from that parking, and it also kind of just it it self manages the the system. So I think clearly, yeah, definitely these reforms help to expose the highest use of the the curb. I think some of the confusion may be that that uh on-street parking spaces are not mandated, they're there or they're not there. Yep. Uh, whereas the off-street ones were in fact mandated by law to be created. Um, but I, I took that question to, to say that, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you eliminate the off-street ones, the demand's gonna go up for the on-street parking. Um, uh, and um, well, in any event, that was a good answer. Um, is there a point where marketized parking meters do not break even for smaller communities? So is there a scale issue? Um, is there a population threshold that needs to be met to make implementing uh, some of these strategies, uh, particularly uh, charging for on-street parking, feasible? I'll, I'll dive into that one. So I've, I've looked into this question a lot for different cities um, and different places. and um, the 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 answer basically is you, you know there are some areas out in the countryside where um it may not make sense to charge for parking because uh and and generally if an area is has so little parking demand even with that even after you've removed all minimum parking requirements for new development that the streets don't fill up for example let's suppose it's ranch land in Montana, um, then it doesn't make sense to charge for parking. Um, and the, the evidence for that is that you've gotten rid of minimum parking requirements. The, uh, the street hasn't filled up with parked cars. Um, however, if you ever reach the point anywhere where the street is filling up with parked cars, um, then it's quite likely that it um, is gonna break even or or uh, more than cover cost to charge for parking. There's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, um, it's no longer necessary to install physical infrastructure in most places uh, on the street to charge for parking. Modern nations don't have any parking meters on the street. They simply use pay by phone because just about every driver now carries a cell phone. Um, and you can always have the backup of paper permits sold at different outlets. Um, for the very vanishingly small group who don't have a, a meter. So you just put up signs allowing people to pay by phone. Um, the, um, it, it's true that enforcement doesn't always break even, but there's one more thing. Keep things in perspective. The, the, the cost of um, buying meters and putting them in and managing curb parking is, it's like the equivalent of, um, loose change 
behind the couch um, when it, you compare it to the size of most transportation projects. States are throwing billions of dollars into freeway expansions that make no sense. Don't get hung up on the minor cost of, of meters and stuff. Go get some federal money or state money and, and use it for, for the startup costs. Um, we have uh, a question with regard to popular tourist destinations and how would you approach for reforming? Um, uh, what kind of reforms are you seeing in places that are uh, popular uh, tourist destinations? Uh, you know, have a... Uh, how to control demand um, in, in places like that, um, where there is maximum demand for parking often. Katie, have you seen any of that or? Uh... Um, I think Patrick could take this in, in terms of on-street parking, but I would say um, for these, towns that get a lot of seasonal visitors, um, they also need the flexibility to build the amount of housing for their residents and their workers to live. Um, right, this is something that um, a conversation that happened in Anchorage when they were talking about getting rid of their parking minimums is they have um, this area that's far outside of town, Girdwood, which is a ski area. And there's people that work there at those ski resorts that can't afford to, to buy a home in that area, right? So they have like a long commute down a, um, from another part of town. Um, which is like one reason why they got rid of parking requirements citywide, right? Because there's people in all areas um, that need to have a lower barrier to finding housing. Very good point. Yeah, uh, I, I tell you here in San Francisco, um, we remember the words of Mark Twain who said that we should um, pay for things by taxing foreigners who live in other countries. And that is our practice here. We rake in millions of dollars in parking revenue. We're charging eight bucks an hour for curb parking in places like Fisherman's Wharf from people who drive in from all over. Um, and we use that to fund great things like free concerts in the park and lots of other good stuff. Um, the cars of tourists are the problem that causes a lot of cities to say, well, we're, we got too many tourists. Here in San Francisco, the cars of tourists are this gigantic, fountain of money. Um, so the first thing to do is charge for parking, get rid of uh, all of your minimum requirements. Um, we also tax parking. You know, we, we, if you're a tourist and you park in an off street lot in San Francisco, we charge you a ton. We charge like 50 bucks a spot for baseball games. Um, you know, we, we, it's a fountain of money. It's just great. And so, um, just charge the heck out of out of parking and cut taxes for your residents. Um, and like, it, especially if you live in a residential area near a tourist destination, it's a fountain of money for your neighborhood. Laguna Beach charges three bucks an hour to park at meters in residential um, streets near the beach. Um, and the residents get to park at those same meters for a $40 a year permit. Um, and they make millions which funds all the lifeguards and beach cleanup and everything else that like 100,000 bidders a year leave behind when they come. So it's great, yeah. So we got a question, how does the proliferation of ride share and delivery uh, fit in, especially the curb parking policies and parking mandates? Um, uh, you know, hail, ride hailing um, may cut down on parking, but it also probably adds to traffic congestion which is another factor, but uh, um, so any thoughts on that? I, I do, th I do think that the, I mean, anything that, that uh, there's, these are double-edged sword, of course, right? I mean, like on one hand, they, they can increase congestion. On the other hand, I think that they, they do expand people's imagination on what it is to live and not at least drive yourself around as much or whether you need to have access to your own personal car. Um, it's a little bit of a hot take, but like, I think that, that like, you know, really the existence of, of ride share companies, when I got rid of my car almost 15 years ago, everyone thought I was totally crazy. I had a kid, um, you know, we did have a zip car, but like, it was like, that was like, how can you do this? And just a few years later, after the ride share companies came along, it was like, okay, that's not for me, but I can understand how this is a possible way to live where in an emergency or whatever people are cooking up 
you know, like how do you get around? So I think that they 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 definitely help. Uh, I mean, they they can they provide an, an a, a, a reliable answer to the idea of how does someone do something without a car? Um, and and what I what I I can tell you from my personal experience, you just end up driving less and less the longer you don't have a car, most likely. Um, but but I think that that they are putting additional pressure onto the need to manage the curb. So I think that those, the, 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 these these drop you know more deliveries, drop zones, ride shares, they are pushing cities to rethink how they're using their curb and create more of a flexible. Um, approach and and looking at also the value and the revenue that could be coming out of of the curb space. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, what we're seeing in city after city is that even before rideshare, the curb parking in most cities was well used and and often overcrowded, while the off street parking, which had been required to build too much was half empty oftentimes. So rideshare and other options have exacerbated that. Now there's even more competition for the thin fringe of curb parking spaces um, or loading areas. And the off-street garages are even emptier, like substantially emptier. So San Francisco has done a couple good things. They have um, instituted the tax on every um, pick up and drop off that occurs in the city by ride sharing agencies to help offset the congestion. And second, at places like um, San Francisco Airport, they've started converting some off street areas into dedicated ride share pick up and drop off zones, like an entire level of garage at San Francisco Airport. Um, we have a, uh, a comment on, on uh, the complexity of managing curbside parking in residential blocks near commercial zones. This is sort of often the flashpoint of uh, park, parking requirements. Uh, and um, um, how, how do you deal with that? I think it's important in these conversations to point out that they're getting rid of parking mandates isn't going to bring a lot of like new buildings to your neighborhood that's going to destroy your neighborhood. Uh, in your community, there are already lots of buildings that exist that could not possibly meet today's zoning code. And that if something terrible happened to like the street or the neighborhood you live on and it had to be rebuilt to today's code is going to be much more spread out and require much more parking than is probably there existing today. And I think that's a really important point for people to to talk about when they're because you know a lot of people if you haven't heard of a parking mandate you hear we're going to get rid of this parking regulation and you think oh my gosh that means there's going to be less parking than now um, but in reality there could be a, a similar amount right parking could be built at the same rate that already exists in your neighborhood um, so that i think is like an important point to bring up that there's lots of buildings that are likely beloved by your community and that you wouldn't want torn down um, but that don't have enough parking spots to meet what's in the code. And I think those are really good examples to bring up when we're having these conversations about regulatory reform. Yeah. I think this issue also gets to the, um, you know, the parking scarcity, uh, like particular blocks where there is parking scarcity, where people are, are going to avoid the parking meters and then they're parking in residential zones. Um, how do you deal with that? You know, when, when we, um, are presenting to audiences about this kind of situation, often where a new development is proposed near a residential neighborhood, I usually present a toolkit of strategies. And the first thing I do is talk about the importance of protecting residential neighborhoods from spillover parking. And I present a, a toolkit of options. One is a parking benefit district, where just like Laguna Beach, um, they could allow us a limited number of visitors to park in their neighborhood and get money. Another option I present is what I did when I set up uh, this uh, at Stanford, which was a residential permit zone for the faculty neighborhood where non-residents are simply not allowed, only residents and their guests who have guest permits. Um, and then the next thing we often do is we show a toolkit of parking reform measures that reduce traffic and pollution from new developments. And most of those are things like, hey, 
let's require the unbundling of parking costs from rents at new apartments in the district. Here's the evidence showing that this will cut traffic in half and vehicle ownership in half from those new apartments. Now, it, we can only do this if we protect you with a residential permit zone. Would you like a residential permit zone? And everybody's like, oh yeah, we'd love one. So at least many reasonable people are that way. And usually we can get durable majority support for managing the curb parking with one of those tools. So we have passed the error point and I will point out to people that in, in uh, tomorrow we will uh, post this video. Uh, so if you have to go, um, you can see, um, we're gonna probably continue answering questions for, uh, for a little bit longer. Um, and uh, you can go check out the video if you have to leave now. Um, so, uh, Okay, there's a question about the fire department requirements for 20 foot clear zones. Uh, when retrofitting suburban streets, uh, we usually wanna have these streets, um, have street trees and sidewalks, and that leaves a tight amount of space for vehicle storage. Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, there's, a, there's a great report from the National Association of City Transportation Officials and another really good report from the Congress for the New Urbanism's Emergency Response Initiative, which I co-led. And the NACTA report basically is a report on buying trucks that fit the kind of cities you wanna have rather than, and basically buying vehicles, large vehicles that fit the kind of cities you wanna have. Um, in most of the civilized world, they use fire engines that fit and work fine and operate perfectly on streets that have only 10 to 12 feet of clear width between parked cars. For example, the hoses attach at the rear of the fire engine when you're pumping water instead of on the sides like American trucks. So the first thing is spend a little money to get some vehicles that actually fit the city you want. Um, Absent that, um, if you set parking prices or curb parking permits at a level that leaves some some spaces between parked cars, um, you know that that say you bring occupancy down to, oh maybe you decide sixty percent is what you want on that street, um, then that's another way to make sure there's ample gaps. But frankly, you know if you've got front facing driveways. A third of the street is probably driveways anyway, so um, there's probably plenty of room for people to pull over and let cars pass. Um, let's see, I mean, there's a question having to do with uh, parking management programs, so which ones are most effective because um, you, uh, when you're when you're eliminating the parking requirements, uh, minimum you know minimum uh, off street parking requirements, you have to have parking management in place generally. And uh, I think you've you've you already talked about this to a degree, Patrick. But any other thoughts on parking management programs? One I thing mean, I was I'm sorry. Go ahead, Katie. I was going to say I have one to add. Um, you know, a lot of times we talk about this, we think about big cities that are already really busy. Um, there's a lot of cars parked at the curb, but a lot of the cities that have eliminated parking minimums are really small towns that maybe don't have a parking meter, don't have bus service. There is not an immediate need for curb management, like the year after you eliminate parking minimums. It's really good to have those tools, right? Um, to kind of assuage people's worries that we can manage the parking supply and there's not gonna be a crisis and a shortage of, of parking available for you. Um, but you don't have to be a big city with lots of management programs to do this tool. Um, because the reality is, is the parking requirements in your community are building more parking than is what get, is getting used today. And that is, uh, I haven't met anyone from a single town that, um, that has said otherwise. So yeah. there are very small communities that have done these reforms. Um, and it doesn't mean that people have to sell their cars or stop driving. Um, there's still a, an abundant amount of parking and most people have no idea um, that this reform even took place. Look at, a, look at a map of the county by county changes in population in the United States over the last decade. And you will notice that most of the counties in America are 
losing population. So frankly, if you're losing population, do you really think you're, you're going to need more parking? We have a question about examples of residential street parking management programs that are more equity focused, uh, where people who live in apartments have equal access to street parking. Um, also, they would like to appreciate insights into political other challenges of managing residential street parking. Well, so equity. Um, I, I can give an example here in Portland. Um, you know, it's not there. There's not. We're still, this is still really a, an area that does need a lot of work on implementation. I think there's plenty of great ideas and strategies. A lot of them are pretty logical, makes sense, like of how, of how you can, how you can make these systems work better. In Portland, in Northwest Portland, um, we have combined meter and permit districts and the, the, there's a couple things going on there. One, they do allow people who live in apartments that are recently built with no parking to purchase permits but they are not, um, they, like the, the apartment has a smaller allotment than an apartment that might've been built prior to the, the parking uh, benefit district going into place. Um, they also use a lot of the revenue in Northwest Portland for a thing called the transportation wallet, which is um, transportation benefits towards, you know, it actually, it, there's, there's a program for low income households that's like a free set of transportation benefits. And then there's a uh, a wallet which is available just at a discounted price to any resident in the in the permit district so i think that that um i mean i think we'll keep hopefully we'll keep advancing these policies and, and especially with the technology that's available maybe move towards more you know auction or bidding based things where kind of all may park all must pay um access and then redistributing that money to people in the actually the people in the district is would be my you know kind of I think ideal here, but um, I don't there know if other folks have some examples. Low income permits, right? That are quite cheap. I mean, on street permits are are pretty cheap. Usually less than what you'd pay to park in a private garage. Yeah. Right. They do in Northwest. They discount the price. I mean, I think that it's worth criticizing that a little bit. In that, if you're a low income household that has a car, you get a discounted permit. And if you're a low income, in many places, we do discounts like that. And if you're a low income household that doesn't have a car you're not receiving any subsidy from the city. So I think that we should, when we're looking at the equity offsets for these, look for universal transportation benefits or more universal transportation benefits rather than directing subsidy towards households that are fortunate enough to own it. Yeah. I mean, one thing that's really important to remember and to describe when, whenever you start a conversation about this is the status quo in the United States is deeply unjust. 99%, well, first of all, the average household um, that is low income gets around by walking, biking, and riding the bus. And, and wealthy households get around by driving far more. The wealthy people drive more, park more, they own more vehicles, they use a lot more parking, and they're getting it all for free. The cost is being hidden in the cost of other goods and services that we all uh, pay for. Um, it is, it is actually not an act of equity that you raised taxes in your downtown to build a garage. And now the blind person who walks downtown to buy his groceries has to pay for parking through his taxes that he can't use and doesn't need. Um, so it, I often find it useful to examine the city budget to see how much money is going into the status quo of paying for all that parking. Um, and then notice that it's not being paid by just the motorists, but by everybody. Um, the, um, another, you know, another thing is to show all the research on your city's minimum parking mandates are driving up rents and home prices and pushing some people into homelessness because the rents are more expensive. So don't let anybody get away with saying, oh, well, the status quo is, is a model of social justice. And by fighting for continuing to let rich people park on the street for free, I'm a big social justice warrior. It's like, no, the, the, uh, um, frankly, um, one thing you do have to be careful about is the politics. Like here in San Francisco, all the meter revenue in the city is dedicated to um, Muni and the vast majority of it goes to the bus system. 
that's very equitable. It's much more equitable than most American cities. The problem is all those low income muni riders are not a strong political force that is well organized to go demand more curb parking charges to fund better bus service. So you, the, the revenue return to the neighborhoods that Don Chup recommends is politically really savvy. Um, and I think it's also often much more equitable but keeping you got to balance both these things or you get done nothing done there's a question about the correlation between parking um, minimum uh, elimination or rollback and acceptance and areas that have um, robust public transportation um, um, another way of thinking about it is, is it does it really help to have uh, public transit um, in uh, in parking reform it helps politically because people who don't live near public transit say that's fine for them. I'm happy with these, um, you know, possibly no parking buildings going in away from my house, not where I live. Um, but parking mandates don't make sense anywhere. But we are seeing right a number of reforms that are transit related. Um, but that's probably not going to stay the case over the next decade. Uh, yeah, I, th I think in a way, the level of transit that people ex like the, the opponent to reforms expect needs to be in place is unattainable in most places in the United States in any sort of reasonable time frame. Um, and I think that the, that it's useful to I, I, and I and I think it's also you know we have to really think about there's a lot of thought, talk about transit oriented development or why we put these things on corridors but i think you got to recognize that when you're building a parking space you're betting against transit you're betting against walkability you're betting against all these things in that neighborhood so the best way to build out your transportation network at the very least i would say if your city or your or your 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 state or anything is looking at a transit oriented uh, reform it's better than nothing but try and get them at least to do um projected transit you know allow the allow the exemptions on places where there's a transportation project in your regional transportation plan or something so that you're built your so that because it takes a long time to build anything so you want to build the things today that support the city that you want to look like tomorrow yeah and this debate is happening i mean i'm pretty familiar with uh, washington there's some bills in the state legislature right now and there's kind of this um attitude that has like, I feel like been expressed a lot of, well, the transit's not good enough for me to stop driving. Therefore, I don't think this reform makes sense. And that's fine, but there's already people that live there in your town that don't own a car or maybe just own one car, right? You can go to the census data and you can find out how many households in your city own zero or one cars. And you can look up what the parking requirements are. And once you know that a two bedroom apartment requires 1.75 parking spots, but then there's 7,000 households that don't own two cars, right? That own zero or one car. Um, these people are already not being served well with like what's legal to build for housing. And all this does is it legalizes options and it gives people more choices for what kind of place they would like to live. Um, nobody has to move into a building that doesn't have a parking spot for them if that's not what they want. Um, if you have like three children and two cars, find a place that has a parking spot, you know? Um, so what we're really talking about is increasing the number of options, um, but transit shouldn't be a barrier to this reform um, because your city doesn't have good enough transit for everyone to sell their car. That's not um, what this reform is about. Yeah. I, I, go ahead. Um, oh, I, I uh, you know, what we're seeing in cities around the country is that senior citizens in auto dependent areas are reaching the point where they're realizing they shouldn't be driving or in many cases their failing eyesight or other disabilities are making it impossible for them to drive they don't want to leave their neighborhood and home of decades so Many senior citizens, for example, have home equity and want to build an accessory dwelling unit on their property and rent it out. I had, I had one neighbor who used to rent her um, old garage that had been converted to an ADU to a college student. In return, the college student did yard maintenance and gave her rides to all her critical appointments, like doctor's appointments, because she couldn't drive anymore. Well, if you're a somebody who says that 
no, she shouldn't have been allowed to convert her garage, that she should have been forced to comply with one size fits all off street parking requirements because she's a senior citizen in an auto dependent neighborhood. Well, she couldn't have converted their garage into the housing that created the student who gives her free rides, right? So when you impose one size fits all mandates because you think you know what's best for senior citizens in auto oriented areas and can't understand their disability and can't understand their creative solutions, you are showing, I think, a level of um, self-importance and arrogance that planners like us should really try to avoid. We should try to give more options and um, put more focus on letting people do what they want on their own private property. And planners like us can learn how to manage the curb parking that the city actually owns. Yeah, and most of the time, right, we're not talking about buildings that have zero parking at all. We're talking about um, a builder who wants to build 17 spaces instead of 23, right? We're talking about really small changes, but that requirement poses a really big barrier if the property can't support that amount of parking spaces. Okay, well, we're not really getting, we, you know, we've had so many questions, we're probably not going to get to them all. Um, um, maybe I'll ask this one. Um, uh, somebody asks, in what city um, are parking requirements most damaging um, or maybe have been most damaging? Any nominations for that? Uh, um, is it Houston? Uh, we saw, you know, photos. Is it Hartford? Where? where? Wow. Probably can't say, but can you? Uh... I, in 2013, I went to the closing meeting for my work on the East Palo Alto general plan update. This is a historically African American city in near near my hometown of Palo Alto in Stanford um, that uh, is now um, full of families living. Over, in overcrowded single family homes. The density of homes has been limited to avoid curb overcrowding. The city imposes strict minimum parking mandates. Well, they finally got, I, I was surprised when I walked into the meeting because it was packed to overflowing with angry citizens. And I thought, what's going on? It turned out that the city had finally gotten funding to hire two code enforcement officers. And they had gone door to door enforcing minimum parking regulations for the first time in many years. And that meant that they were red tagging a whole bunch of houses for having families living two or three to a home illegally living in garages. Well, the city that had turned out dozens of families onto the street who were now living in things like their cars in church parking lots because they chose to prioritize housing for cars over housing for people. You know, they were focused on let's make ample free curb parking and not on how many people are going to lose their homes when we when we force people to comply with minimum parking requirements. So that is something I'll never forget. And I can't have an equity conversation about parking without thinking about the pastor and all of those families who were like we we need homes. We need homes for our families, not not for our cars. It's a great it's a great example. Thank you, Patrick. You know, I think that we probably will close this uh, now. I'm sorry for questions we did not get to, um, but there was just so many. Um, but it, this has been a really great conversation. I thank everybody who joined us, and uh, thank you, Katie, Patrick, Tony, um, for a. Um, a really enlightening discussion on parking. And uh, we'll see everybody uh, later on, on the park bench. All right. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for hosting us. Bye. Yeah. Take care. Thank you.